Act 3, Scene 7, Where the Strangers Come From. Well, this can't be right. It looks like an old church. Well, it's muddy. Yeah, that's what he said. Crystals and then mud. Okay. I want to stay outside. Okay. I'll stay with him. We can look for lizards. Okay, we'll make it quick. Whoa. Oh, that's unexpected. You play as them instead of the people going into the church. An epitaph is engraved in the stone gray marker. Paul Aguiano, generous disposition, will be missed. Below the inscription, a note written in white chalk. HT, 8191T, fill date June 9, notes of almond. Chris Descartinet and Josie Mollis, we think you two would have really liked each other. HT8192B, fill date July 24th, weird finish. Yeah, it's the distillery, it's the whiskey distillery graveyard. That is fucked up and awesome. Ah. Rodney Brett, always had a far off look, probably still does. HT8192E, aftertaste of rainwater. Gregory Peng or Brandon Boyer. H1 HT 8192N sweet and fungal. Get it cuz distillery they distill spirits. Robert Ashley would have wanted it that way or this way. Maple turpentine. Christine Roper. Should have said something. Sense of foreboding. God, I would love to drink a whiskey that has a sense of foreboding. Unknown. Seemed reasonable. Easy on the nose. Find any lizards? I wasn't really looking. Nice cover story, kid. Why do you dress like a punk? A punk? <laughs> you know what's a punk dress like, kid? Can you tell me? I dress like Junebug, specifically. Sounds lonely. Not for us. Just gotta make choices and own them. Think I was born this foxy? I came off the assembly line about a half foot shorter and all gray. No eyes. They were gonna have us clearing out the old mine. Doesn't matter what you look like under all that rock and water. Bunch of gray shadows, shoveling and hammering invisibly the walls, draining the tunnels. Joni found some gear, an old tape player. We hid away in an underwater cave and listened to it over and over. We knew we weren't miners. Slipped out onto the road, these two featureless shadows. Ever since the night, we've been detailing, coloring in, specifying. I feel more like myself every day. I feel less like myself without my folks. Sure, well, some people are born into a family. Nothing wrong with that. There you are, what you find in there? It wasn't. Hi, hey, what's going on? You look flush, old man. It doesn't matter. Right, okay, we got what we need. Let's go. Act three, scene eight. Hall of the Mountain King. Um, lines from Kublai Khan modified. 
We found your strangers. We know how to fix your damn machine. But I'm not sure it was worth it. Oh. Soon. Visions will return. They say you need to type in a specific phrase to restore it. Huh? A bit of a poem? Rally the illustrious spirit? Oh, of course. Now then, type away. By all means, don't hesitate. Type away. Come along. Come along, androgynous robot person. Xanadu, my friends. This is Xanadu. And yeah, we'll just we'll just go till we close it. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so we're supposed to type dome in air. <laughs> Weird. Just following instructions. Here we go. Act 3, Scene 9, Xanadu. You are standing at the end of the road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. Uh, check, check out the building. Enter building. It is a text adventure. Inside building. You are inside a building, a storage shed for the National Park Service. There is a sensible, modern electric lantern nearby. Get the lantern. Get a lantern. Taken. Exit building. Enter forest. That's not something you can enter. Just type a direction. Uh, north. In forest. forest with a deep valley to one side. Oh, can we climb a tree? Uh, climb tree. I don't think much is achieved by that. I'm oh, sorry. Can we dig a hole? Oh, dig a hole. You can't see any such thing. Pretty limited vocabulary. Uh, south? You're in forest. Oh, hey, it's a maze. South? So, you're in forest. Lula is here, soldering replacement components in a small handmade radio. Oh, we should talk to her. Ask Lula uh, how she's doing. Hi, Donald. I'm getting the strangest interference out here. I've been tuning the radio circuits gradually as we go, swapping capacitor values and tweaking resistor networks. It was working for a while, but everything I pick up sounds so distant and muffled. Lula hands you the radio. Well, maybe you'll have better luck. You're good at this stuff. Just don't forget to give it back. You're in forest. Joseph is here, tapping with a small stylus on a modified pocket braille slate. A small gray kitten, no more than a few weeks old, dozes comfortably on top of his backpack. Listen. Donald, I was just transcribing your footsteps. Sounded like... Joseph runs his fingers along the index card he's been tapping on from right to left. 
Long, weary song, drearily gone, dearly gone. You beat a melancholy shuffle through these woods, Donald. Ha! I've been noting down the sounds of the forest with an ear for speech, and an inborn filter for poetry, I suppose, so maybe it's me being melancholy after all. I'm eager to see what the poetic subsystem makes of these punched cards. At edge of hole. Oh boy. That looks... yikes. You are the edge of a massive hole. The dirt gives way to rock and the ground sinks into darkness. The computer tied to your upper back slickens with sweat in the afternoon sun. The rope slung around your shoulder is slipped under the strap of your backpack, digging uncomfortably against your collarbone. Let's do it. Down. The cave walls are too slick to climb safely without assistance. You lose your footing and fall to your death. Rest in peace. Your score was zero out of a possible 8,192. Wait, what? You may continue or quit. Uh, continue. At edge of hole. Maybe we need to climb down more carefully? Try using the rope to climb down safely. Tie rope to tree. The rope is tied snugly to a tree trunk down. Your feet slip a few times in the slimy rock, but you remain stable. Lula and Joseph descend carefully after you. I think that they're real. I think that they're like, like actually, like, I, there's a person with a computer on their back that we're issuing commands to in a real place. You are in bed quilt, a long east-west passage with holes everywhere. Joseph and Lula remove the computer equipment they're carrying on their backs and begin setting up. And that's the last trip, so everything's down here now. Set up gear. I only understood you as far as wanting to set the up above. Set the up above. Lula looks pensive. Ask Lula about cave. Having second thoughts, I don't blame you. It's unsettling down here. Weird acoustics. Earlier as we were climbing down, I thought I heard voices for a moment, or not voices themselves, but the echo of voices singing. Eerie, tuneless working song. I'm glad I'm not down here alone. Ask Lula about gear. Sure, Donald. We may as well take inventory. I've got the tape machine and synthesizer parts we borrowed from the School of Music. It's all tuned up to my voice, so we won't have to type so much. Joseph has his slate and the punched cards he's transcribed from the poems we read him. We've got the typewriter and the paper tape reader. And you've got the CRT display. How's your back holding up? Joseph looks uncomfortable. Huh, jealous. Hey, Donald, can you help me? Uh, wire up these generators. I'll assemble the synthesizer, but I could use some help with the serial interface if you have time. You hear an unfamiliar echo from a tunnel to the east. Maybe if we help Lula, she'll have more to tell us. Uh, help uh, Lula. Thanks, Donald. I can never remember which color lead goes to which pin. Lula begins unpacking a box of wires and terminals. Do you think there are old paintings down here? Cave paintings from, I mean, old pottery shards from when the world was young and early men and women huddled in these caves to... Do you know, I think cultural fossils are the saddest fossils. Sadder than animal remains, I mean. We might come across a petrified mollusk or a partial dinosaur footprint and say, there was a point of contract here where a little body touched the earth and maybe there's a little bit of evidential garbage. But the life that owned that body never cared and moved on anyway. And that's the end of it. But I suppose I shine my lantern on one of these walls and see a crude painting, thousands of years old. Two men and a woman, charcoal and blood on rock. Someone put that there to keep the rock after she passed. Hope. A relationship, a moment, worry maybe, a regret. She made a painting to keep something alive for her, but I like the dead mollusk and that itinerant dinosaur. Had to move on. Whatever it is is gone. And now we're looking at this painting, this dangling copy with no original. You're interrupted by the ominous echo of a grating, scraping sound from the east, louder than before. What the hell was that? Let's check it out. In tunnels.
rush down the tunnel with Joseph and Lula close behind. How do you like all this, kid? There's a lot of reading, but I'm really good at that anyway. The tunnel narrows, and soon you find yourself crawling on your hands and knees. Navigating the tunnel becomes more awkward as soon as the rock gives way to jagged, crystalline surfaces. Scratches and taps echo from the end of the tunnel, some short and piercing, some groaning and louder, as if dampened by water. The tunnel opens into a large room. In a crystal room. Oh god, who's that? Who are they? Miners? You are in a large, irregular chamber. The walls, floor, and ceiling are covered with crystalline projections. Strangers are here, scraping black mold from the crystals. They look up when you enter. One of them seems about to speak. Finally! Let's listen to what he has to say. The stranger reaches for a box he's carrying and presses a plastic button. The box whirs to life, and a crackly voice blurts out something unintelligible and slows to a deep gurgle. He looks at his companions momentarily in confused disappointment, then returns his awful gaze to you. Joseph flees through a tunnel to the north. Lula flees through a tunnel to the northeast. Run north. Lula's headlamp scans the northern passage as you run. Soft shadows loom perplexingly from the floor to ceiling. You feel around a distinguished shadow from crystal, but find yourself corner. You've hit a dead end. See, look, now it's actually her voice. Uh, who are they? Let's find a way out of here. Escape. That's not a verb I recognize. Look for escape. You can't see any such thing. Listen, I think they've gone back to work. They seem strange somehow. Maybe they've forgotten about us. All right, let's pass them quickly now. Don't make eye contact. We'll find our way back to the equipment. In bed quilt. You were in bed quilt, a long east-west passage with holes everywhere. Lula is here, panting for breath. <sighs> Did they follow us? Where's Joseph? Search. I only understood you so far as wanting to search. Search equipment. The various computer and audio equipment cast angular shadows in the tunnel as they cast as they scan slowly the, across the pile. Nothing. Search outside. You grab hold of the rope and climb up. Your days lecturing an esoteric computer science topic do not prepare you to scale walls with rope. Your evenings gathering with friends to roll dice and consult fancifully illustrated charts, however, prepared you for the likelihood this climb could end badly. You carefully descend back into the cave. Joseph emerges suddenly from one of the tunnels. That damn sound, those damn voices, I don't even know what direction I was running. I wove through that network of tunnels, I ran my hand along the wall, always turning left, but ever turn, every rock felt the same, for all I knew I was running in circles. Finally, I ended up here, and I hid, I panicked, I heard you talking, but I didn't think I could trust my senses. But listen, there's one thing I have to tell you, while I was out there lost in the tunnels and cave, I came across the zero end. I had no idea. It's like a real place. They pick up garbage, deliver mail, they go to work and to church, but it has an awful kind of emptiness. Wandering through, I heard horrible echoes. Weird images got burned in my mind's eye. A television, a scarecrow, a crystal, a feather, a sandwich, a CRT monitor, a bottle, an anchor. Lula looks down at her feet. What's up with Lula? Ask Lula what is up. Nothing. Just, Joseph, you sound disturbed. Lula, you've heard the same damn stories I have. It doesn't matter now, damn it, I'm leaving. To hell with all of it. Getting back on track, we're so close. Divert Joseph's attention. You shout something at Joseph about the project you're working on together. You'll die in these damn cold caves, and what about these men? You know they'll come back. Tell him we can hide from the strangers. You shout something at Joseph about going deeper into the caves. Did you hear their voices? They're not... They'll find you, but not me. I'm going back to the surface. Stop. Your stupid fight is ringing through the whole damn cave. Joseph is right. We can't stay here. I'm leaving, too. I'm not going back to the surface. I'm taking my station wagon. And I'm heading down the zero. Oh, no. Don't let her leave us here. Get Lula's attention. You plead with Lula about your continued collaboration. I'll send you this tape when I'm done recording. I'll put it in the mail, and you'll see what your damn machine does with it. Lula and Joseph have left in tunnels. Abandoned by your collaborators, your confidants, your companions, the only two among your colleagues with whom you've ever trusted, the gift of your friendship, 
Pretty thick, sounds like Beardo had his heart broken. You wander the tunnels alone, dragging the components of your unrealized masterpiece, combing the underground passage for a new set in which to realize your vision. Sounds like a genius. How do you mean? Vain. Vanity. Ain't it the truth? My aunt Remedios, before she got into the whole ethnomusicography, she was a painter, mostly nudes in oil. She had this model, I'll never forget him, big classically physical guy. Looked like he was about to storm Troy, everyone called him the Colonel. Weaver and I saw this guy naked a lot. You couldn't help it, he was always posing somewhere in the room, chasing the light from room to room, while Aunt Remedios made a sketch of his profile or worked on the right mix of pigments for his ab abdomen. He had, you know, he had this magnificent hair. Long black hair that ran down just to the bottom of his shoulder blades. One evening, he was standing next to an open window in the back of his house. The sun was setting. Early spring, I think. It was kind of windy. Aunt Remedio was trying to get his hair right. She kept arranging it like half an hour, half in front and half behind, running over his shoulder, laying across his chest in this very specific way, but it itched him or something to do this weird indignant shuffle, or the wind from the open window would push it around, and he'd start to turn his neck again. When Reaver and I ran by, everything would be tangled again. The final product was a swirl of black lines billowing across the top of his neck. Weird thing is, I don't remember his face now. Just that black swirl. Probably the best one she ever painted. Hall of the Mountain King. After what may have been years, you stumble out of a tunnel into a cavernous open space. Stalactites adorn the ceiling like grotesques. In the center of the room is an enormous rocky spire. This is where you will set up your equipment and establish your legacy. Now is the time to continue your work. Research assistance, zero. Realism index, 37%. Romance index, 2%. Mold coverage, 0%. You may hire a new research assistant, assign assistance to a task, or sleep until tomorrow. Time passes. Now is the time to continue your work. Uh, hire. Uploading job advertisement to university message boards. You've hired Greg, who studies architecture. Greg, you can be in speculation. Assigning available research assistant to speculation. Hire a new research assistant. No new applicants. Try again later. Sleep. Time passes. Greg muses about the love lives of fungal colonies. Greasy black mold is collecting on the computer equipment. Now is the time to continue your work. Um, hire. You have hired Marianne, who studies fine art. Debugging. You have two research assistants. How many to debug? One. Assign assistants to... Speculation. Sleep. Time passes. Greg identifies a bug with the oxygen level simulation, but is unable to fix it. Marianne posits that nature, not reason, is the master of industry. Intruders! The strangers are doing something to the equipment, but you can't make out what. Look at that. You hide behind a rock until they leave. With trepidation, you emerge from your hiding place hours later. Now is the time to continue your work. I'm not convinced this is getting us any closer to the zero. <sighs> Try to quit and start over. I want to keep playing. All right, let's keep playing. Hire. You have hired Weaver, who studies mathematics. Assign assistance to a task. Transcription. All three of you. Sleep. No, wait. Yes. Keep playing. Sleep. Marianne transcribes the sound of dripping water in all their variations over a period of several hours. Greg extensively notates tunnel diameter as a function of length. Weaver types up some lurid imagery from a dream journal. Weaver follows the strangers into the tunnel. She doesn't return, but neither do they. Now is the time to continue your work. Try to start over. Come on, kid, we got stuff to do. 
quit. Are you sure you want to quit? Yes. That was a rhetorical question. Quit game. I only understood you so far as wanting to quit. Maybe we have to lose or die to start over. Smash the computer. Violence isn't the answer to this one. I guess we can keep playing. Now is the time to continue your work. Hire. You have hired Andrew, who studies statistics. Assign research statistics. Uh, speculation? One. Um. Assign. Debugging. One. Assign. Transcription. Sleep. Wait indefinitely. Time passes. Research assistants come and go, but you don't encounter the strangers again. Sometimes you can hear their uncanny echoes of their voices off in the tunnels. Years pass. Mold accumulates. You and the remaining research assistants take the burning, disused equipment in the center of the room. The black mold is intensely flammable and makes an excellent catalyst. It leaves behind a sweet, narcotic perfume. One night you have visitors, outsiders, different ones. Then later that night, an old friend. You really did go deeper into the caves. Premature end of file. Press any key to quit. Lula's outside now, I bet. I bet you anything. Act 3, Scene 10. Hall of the Mountain King. I wonder if we're going to be able to finish by the time I have to... <laughs> I have to mirror shades. <laughs> yeah, there's Lula. You really did go deeper into the caves. While well, you were easy enough to find... I met a few of your former assistants. One can't help but hear things. So this is what became of our project. Oh, I've made some additions. Joseph stole the data tapes for the first half, so I've had some blank spots to fill. Yes, I know. He published his version, actually. I'm sorry to report. It's been a bit tediously sentimental. We found your doctor. Oh, good. Yeah, you're looking... Not too well, to be honest. You smell like a distillery. Have you been drinking? Conway looks at the floor. Well, I wouldn't blame you if you did. It's so dim here. So you found the address data? Just pass it over to Donald here. Donald, will you be a deer and crunch these numbers? We're looking to sort out a street name collision. Dogwood Drive. How long does this take? It should only be an hour or so. Andrew will carry it over to... I'll be at the bureau for the rest of the night. Just mark it. Private material for the attention of Senior Clerk Chamberlain. How do we get back to the bureau from here? The bridge? Yes, the bridge through the gate over there. We, too, recede into history. Good to... Well, good night, Donald. Meet me at the bureau and get you on your way. Head counterclockwise to the cathode ray, then turn around. It's just clockwise till you find the bureau. Between us, I think you should drive. Someone has left a portable tape recorder in the path. Doesn't appear damaged, but there's no tape to play it with. The bookshelf was carried partway up the path before the project was abandoned. It's still useful, the peak of the spire is crowded anyway. Sensible modern electric lantern's been left here. The batteries have long since died. What's this? Oh, it's a um, cricket. Johnny. And the dog. 
Thanks for waiting, old man. We're gone a bit longer than expected. It'll be okay, old man. Notice how Shannon is the main character now? Whoa! What happened up there? Oh, just a bunch of computers. So what'd they say? Bureau claims spaces. Counterclockwise to the cathode ray, then turn around. Uh, counterclockwise. Uh, the rope? I don't think so. Children. About a dozen children gathered in a shallow, dry basin on the side of the road. Seated on overturned pots and pans in three configurations. One group of five to the right, one group loosely in the center, all facing an older girl on three pans stacked together. The boy at the head of the arrangement looked sternly down on another child. The younger boy kneeled on the stone floor without a pot to sit on. A spare stock pot, perhaps belonging to the younger boy, is set to the side. The older girl nods solemnly to Ezra. The older girl takes a wide green leaf from the floor next to her and pretends to read off a list of charges. The younger child is accused of making agreements for trading card exchanges which he was not able to honor. The judge asks for a witness to testify. A boy describes the participant in events related, depicted on the trading card he was to receive, makes related claims about the defendant's nature. Ezra is prompted to argue on behalf of his client. The judge invites the jury to examine the defendant more carefully. The defendant slightly rearranges his hair. The jury is sequestered a few feet away and returns with a verdict of not guilty. The group of children reconfigure themselves and a new trial begins with a former defendant, now as a judge. Alright, so the rope and the lantern are just objects. Cathode ray. Alright, let's turn around. Do I have to look at it first? What is this? Lost? It's no shame. I'll take over. I'm fine. Sprocket. Oh, the tunnel's widening now. The anchor. They're like constellations. The bicycle. Feather. The cactus. The antlers. The scarecrow. Objects described in the tunnel. And there's the bureau. Act three. Scene 11, Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces. Well, let's go. Yeah, like we're primarily Shannon now. Nobody comes to meet us. Oh, there she is, she just took her sweet time. Hi, Lula. Here you are. Marianne has the rest of the evening off, so I'm minding the desk. Any word on the address? The results came in by courier. Good news, Donald is an assistant. We're able to sort out the noise. I had Rick cross-reference the result against some of our references. So he found a corresponding mail stop on the Echo River route. As it happens, the night ferry is scheduled to make it stop here shortly. The ferryman carries the mail and collects the garbage as well. I'm sure you can catch a ride out that way. You're welcome to wait here. I have to get back to packing. Thanks for your help. Happy to help. Ha <laughs> ha. I suppose we just repeat it till it's true. Safe travels. Try to stay out of the water. It's colder than it looks and deep. Her little like arms at her side and she like walks like a robot too. Oh yeah, and they're all, like, dressed differently now. How long do we have to wait? 
Oh, who knows? All right, what happened? Up to you. It's okay, you can tell him. It doesn't matter anymore. Fine. So we were in that graveyard. Act 3, Scene 12. Where the strangers come from. Yeah, how many acts are there? Or how many scenes are there in Act 3? I'm very curious. So you need to eat before mirror shades. Well, this can't be right. Looks like an old church. With a look inside, I guess. I want to stay outside. Okay. We'll make it quick. Okay, hang on before I go into this church. Sorry for the delay, everybody. I just want to see if we're going to have time to finish it or if we should stop here. Well, apparently the internet doesn't know either. So let's just, uh, we'll, we'll keep going for another well, we'll get, we'll get through this scene, at least, and if this isn't the end, well, we'll just have to wait. I don't know what I expected. The strangers, he kept saying. Kind of vague already, isn't it? Donald's a stranger. Hell, you and I are practically strangers. Listen, earlier in the mine, I didn't want to talk about it, but... You don't have to talk about it. No, it's okay, I want to. When I saw Weaver, she was on TV. I was testing a pretty simple tube repair, flipping through the channels to check the saturation, and she was just there. It was kind of horrible, I mean. I told you she disappeared suddenly, ran away, but we thought... Well, you thought she was dead. Yeah, I guess I don't like to say it. Dead. And the next time I flipped to channel two, Weaver. It's burning my vision now. She's standing in a room. Walls are made of blank kind of gray. There's tape on the walls like markings. Desks? A classroom, maybe. The camera's in the corner, so it's this sort of 45 degree angle in the room, and there's Weaver right in the center of the picture. I stopped turning the dial. Hell, I think I stopped breathing. Eventually she spoke, and there was no real sound, just this awful hum. I read the closed captions. She said to go to the mine, I'd find something there. I don't remember her exact words. Whenever I try, I get distracted. Fuzzy, I... <coughs> <coughs> That's so dusty in here, right? Yeah, real dusty. You think with all these holes in the ceiling? Wait, what the hell was that? Did you hear that? Uh, must have been the church settling. Well, or not. Oh boy, okay. Well, uh, yep, okay. A skeleton. Oh, and now I'm the skeleton. The stranger activates the tape layer slung on his shoulder. A crackly drawl echoes in the room. It's patient and sounds like it should be smiling. My regrets. I hope I didn't keep you waiting long. We don't see a lot of foot traffic these days. I guess you'll hear about the job. I'm afraid we only have one opening at the moment. Horrible business. We're actually looking to get some information about our own computer. Well, I certainly I'll tell you everything you need to know. I've only just met you, but I feel certain there's a place for you here. I'll just take you over to meet the dispatcher, show you the trucks, get you familiarized. 
We can converse as we go. What is this place? Well, it's not an old church. Oh, I guess not, but still, it has a kind of reverence to it. What's that smell like? Bread? Baking bread? Please, follow me. I can... What the fuck? Why do I have the degausser? Where are we? I have to ask you to step in here for a moment. This is for your safety. And adjust your outfits a bit. There's some protective headwear up on the wall back there. Please remove your shoes and eyeglasses. We don't wear glasses. Ah, so that won't be an issue. We'll do us a favor and put the headwear on anyway. Just this way. Where did Conway go? There he is. More news arrival. More new arrivals this evening. Plenty to do. Got to relay the formula. Uh, we actually just need to ask you about a computer. Huh. No, the orientation's all done by voice and rote. We don't believe electronics have a role in our company culture. Computers are tools. Plenty of interesting mechanical this and that ahead, though. Shall we move on? Wow, check this stuff out. It must be decades old, but it's in perfect condition. I really like old electronics. Yeah, I got it bad. <laughs> That's why I got in this business, to keep old stuff like this running. Seems like such a shame to let it fall into ruin. You know, like that computer back in the cave? Xanadu? Decades of engineering, thousands of years of mathematic and philosophy all petrified in a living stone. I could just let that fall apart. Alright. I don't understand the fucking degausser option. Ah, so strange. Here's the fleet. Ha <laughs> ha. Ah, uh, we just use these to get around internally. How big is this place? Oh, it's grown a great deal over the years. Incredible to think, really. When Mr. Bishop founded this operation, it was only more than 1,800 square feet. Half of that was occupied by camouflage to keep the law out. Hiding in the back of an old church, purifying spirits by handmade fire, a kettle and a dream. So the trucks are just easterways and shipping. You can become acquainted with the dispatcher there. Give me a tap on the shoulder. You see something that catches your eye. Always happy to show off the facilities. Sublime machinery. Let's go to shipping, I guess. Tracers, like your eyes are dilated. So this is, I guess, the distillery, or? All right. Right, because the whiskey truck that crashed in Act One. It is. Now, as I have to ask, do you have any kind of experience driving trucks? I drove deliveries for an antique shop up until this last run. Ha <laughs> ha, precious cargo. You will do just fine. You can drive safely, can't you? I haven't any doubt now. It's only after what happened with McGill this evening. I've been driving all my life, for better or worse. I suppose that's all you must say. I like that. Never say more than you must. It's boastful and ugly. I do pity ill fated Miguel. He was good company and slow to anger, but if we're speaking confidentially, what well, with all that lost product to be repaid, bourbon and glass dashed across the interstate, a few casts too. We're all just thankful he had no next kin. Ah, uh, so, let's see if we can ring up the dispatcher. Doolittle starts the truck and switches on the CB radio. A deep, monotonous voice drones from the dashboard speaker. 1020 on that load, come back. Up in the Hum and Burn Cave, 1012, City Kitty. This a good time, dispatch. We may have found Miguel's replacement. Thought you might like to get acquainted. 
Ten nine, come again. Introduce yourself. Uh, hello. Tell dispatch something impressive about yourself. They're very well regarded there. You, you folks know anything about a moldy old computer? Ninety nine wheel holder. Gotta pay the water bill. Uh, so uh, I'm certain they'll call you back before long. Let's take around the truck. Take a look around the truck, eh? Looks like it's just about ready to go out. We have some good, strong folks in shipping here, so you never need to worry about loading if you don't want to. A bit hard on the knees and back at our age, yeah? Of course, you'll have to unload at the destination, but that's the job. Some drivers like the extra shift, stacking and loading here. They really shouldn't do any lifting these days. I'm sure we can spare a dolly and carrying strap for your health and safety. Conway woke up on bailed hay. Everything was too bright. His head hurt. The usual. Lisette and Ira argued loudly outside the open barn door. She wanted Ira to take him inside and shower, have some coffee, get to the job. Ira said there wasn't time. Conway was in no condition. It was an important job. They couldn't put it off. Ira said to let the deadbeat sleep it off and send him packing. He said Charlie could do the job. Conway stepped out of the barn, shielding his eyes. He tried to say something reassuring, but he just sort of stumbled around it. Lisette looked away. Ira spat and went inside to wake Charlie. Ira was a stubborn man, so Charlie went along. And Conway drifted out again. He didn't hear about the accident until months later. So, what's next? Oh, sure, you'll want to have a look. Kick the tires, that's a thing we do, isn't it? As though our knees could exert the kind of force these tires see on the road. We're more likely to hurt ourselves. Isn't that the way, huh? Tires look fine. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't the tires that fade our dear Miguel. I'm quite sure. Conway sat in a dim room full of folding chairs. The walls and ceiling were painted with old smoke. Someone read from a book. He drank coffee, as it is. He was just waiting for it to be over. A few others shared. They spoke in abstractions like a program of action, good orderly direction, spiritual but not religious, religious but not spiritual, all the things we tried. Then it was over and they clasped sweaty hands through a short prayer, stepped back out into mourning. He knew it was time to hit the bar. It was good to get out of the heat, away from the mendacity. He settled into it. Someone else from the meeting was here, looking rough. He focused on the television. A nature show was playing. Something about river dolphins. They cruised the Amazon, eating psychedelic frogs and having weird adventures. Oh my god, we're a dolphin. At night, they transformed into attractive young partygoers, wore hats to cover their blowholes. Now, what else can we show you? Headlights work fine, see? Do little fizzles with the control. It's important. Most our product goes out at night. You never know who you run into in the daylight. And dust can be treacherously misleading with all that indirect light. The magic hour, huh? Magic hour. Sure. The angle of the sun at dusk and dawn means light's mostly indirect reflections from the sky. Everything looks like a movie, all a bit softer. Conway had to get off the highway. Too loud, too murky. He turned onto some gray cornfield in Indiana. He watched traffics, birds. Seeing those migrations close up, they looked random. He thought about the load in the trailer, thousands of plastic cups. Somebody wanted those cups in Rockford that night. It wasn't gonna happen. He was only human. He'd been put out since the headlights were on, didn't even stop for coffee. He cracked a beer at three, eyes on the road. Half past four, he dodged some stray cattle. Headlights coming back on, Rockford could wait. Early morning couldn't be much worse than late night. What could they care? It just needed a few hours. So, moving on. Uh, control the wipers with this knob here. They seem to have decent torque to them, eh? Can't say how they'd fare in an ice storm, but never delay a shipment, better assume the risk. Always clear skies. Down here. So I hear, but most of our product delivered by surface roads, which rain quite often in the spring months. They ditched class for the day to drive in the rain. Pointless to stay, all review. He was a lost cause and she didn't need it anyway. She was smart, bored, it was time to cut out. Shitty day for it though, 83, biblical flood. They went to a bar. They pulled into a dive bar with an afternoon open mic. It smelled like rose water. They smoked cigarettes, drank awful hooch, whistled buckets of rain. She sang about someone she wanted once to have loved. Brown hair curled around her ear. She had a voice like scotch whiskey. They poured another drink, and another, and another. She worried it was getting dark out, then it was getting light out. They ended up in someone else's field, in someone else's car. Early morning joyride in a sunrise collision. She got on the bus, headed back. 
He sat in his car, went over his options. Chicago, Toronto, Barrow. Seemed like a bold and impulsive gesture at the time. As he pulled out of the parking lot, he removed his hands from the steering wheel for a moment and felt the car drift into a decision. Years later, he'd think of this as the moment he himself started drifting. A modest technology, but suited to the job, eh? Plenty good enough. The truck's radio crackles back to life. Driver, come back. Ah, there's dispatch. Now tell him about your experience. Tell him the truck's in good shape. Tell him you'll be driving in the morning. I've been driving for a number of years. Decades, dispatch. 1033, dispatch. Got two black eyes and a flock of crocodiles. Come back. 10-4, back it down and prick your eyelids, driver. Come back, Lamb. 10-4. Come back, wheel holder. Uh, 10-4. Got your ears on? Good. Listen to this. So, I think that went well. Let's head up to logistics, seal the deal, then I got one more thing to show you. <laughs> Whoa, we just like hovered into that seat. Let's go to logistics. Seal the deal. Let's head back upstairs, eh? I got one more thing to show you. Wait, we only came here looking for some answers about this stupid moldy computer. Oh, the old man in the cave with the moldy computer. That black mold is drawn to whiskey, feeds on ethanol fume, you see. We age the whiskey, some of it inevitably evaporates to the air the angels share, goes up through the vents into the caves. If we can scrape up that mold, we apply some pressure and cold to it, squeeze and condense the azel share back into drinkable whiskey. Every drop counts when you make a living on that stuff, so we go down and scrape it off his equipment, just like any other place it grows. He gives in and his people here to drive us away. Paranoid, truly paranoid. Well, now we got the formula, so we don't need to go collecting mold. We didn't do anything to his computer, he just forgot the password. One of his assistants shared it with me. Dome in air. That'll get you going, I'm sure of it. So join me upstairs. If you don't mind. Hey, gotta get those helmets back. I'm really clocking my overtime on this one. I'm gonna finish this scene. <laughs> Here it is, a beauty, wouldn't you say? She's an antique, you know. Oh, what is it? Why, well, it's an adding machine where we come for our daily ritual. Calculate the day's interest and repayment according to the formula. I need to do so at the beginning of my shift so I know how many hours I need in order to keep up. I believe you do well here, sir. Happy to have you. Congratulations, you're hired. Wait, we can't. It's customary to start each day with a shift drink. Let's make it special. Mark the occasion. Top shelf stuff now, single barrel. Wait, he doesn't. Down the hatch. Venom Memoriae Moors. Oh, look, we're back with... We're kind of outside? Decent enough. Welcome aboard. He's not working for you. We have to get back to this... Our... He has a delivery to make. Oh, what's this? Not working? You turning down this opportunity? Um, she's right. I, I have to make this a... Uh, oh, I'm disappointed. You see, that leaves us with a delicate problem. As I indicated, this is the top shelf stuff you're drinking now. It isn't cheap. And if it's not your first shift drink, well, there's a matter of this tour just now. My time and experience are billed at quite a premium. This is not good for you, my friend. You're in quite deep by back-of-the-envelope estimations. Well, we have that in common, I suppose. All of us. I'm afraid you're going to have to work this off somehow. It's just the way of it. Wait, what's happening right now? You can start tomorrow. Take the time to settle your affairs. 
Of course, interest compounds immediately and... Well, we'll go over the formula when you get here. I should get back to work. See you tomorrow, then. So, I guess I start in the morning. Uh, I guess. I'm confused. Just the way these things go, kid. Huh. Well, that still gives us a few hours to roam, right? Where's that ferry? Yeah, like the payment plan from the doctor. Interesting. Was that... End of Act 3. <laughs> oh my god, I love this game. Oh, that was full on worth it. God damn.